Cows and cars, that's the problem. That's right, cows and cows and cars. Let's be honest. Saul, so, thank you so much for that amazing talk and also to coming to chat about a few things. I've got a few questions for you. Sure. Follow-up questions. You talk quite a bit about the opportunity Australia has in relation to climate change, in relation to electrification. How do you think we're doing compared to other countries? And how do you think we're doing compared to what we could do? In terms of policies, we're running close to dead last in the horse race. I think we roughly look in the climate policy setting, like our peer nations are Saudi Arabia, Russia, Venezuela and other petro states. That said, I think we could, on an implementation level, we're actually leading the world, which takes a bit of explaining, but I actually believe. And I think the opportunity is to leapfrog the ambitious policy settings that was what the US just achieved with the Inflation Reduction Act. And I think Australia has the opportunity to be even more ambitious than the US because I do this economic modelling and energy modelling globally and the economics work best and first in Australia. So we can afford to be bolder than America. And because we've just been doing such a bang up job on rooftop solar here in the last decade, Australians households and small businesses have a positive association with electrification and the, the things that are climate solutions. Mm -hmm. So on the ground, they're like at tradie level and household level, mm -hmm. we've got more people ready to do the work and we've got more people ready to buy the things and better informed. And quite honestly, the Australian public is hugely ahead of American public on sort of climate awareness. You know, we live in this fragile mm -hmm. continent, we know it. Mm -hmm. We've all seen the bushfires and the floods, so I think we're also more ready for faster action. Yeah, and it's, it's clear even with something like the electrification of transport, even your own transport. We've seen, a, you know, Australians, you know, four or five years ago thinking maybe an electric car to now, people are trying to get their hands on them even yeah. before those prices have come down. So The, the, the right time to have good electrification <laughs> transport policy was about 10 years yeah. ago. So we're basically last in line in the international supply chain for electric vehicles, which is dumb. Because if you can run an electric vehicle off rooftop solar, it's literally the economics are one or two cents a kilometer. And yeah. that's like compared to the average Australian car, which is paying 20 to 25 cents mm -hmm. a kilometer. So that's why we can afford to be ambitious. Like the, the, the numbers work here in an extraordinary way. And that's why you have to understand that we've got to align policy at all federal, state and local level to enable this thing to happen quickly um, because you know, a history of 20 years of really no climate policy has put us behind the apple. And you consult to governments of all kinds and to business. Where do you think the Australian business community is on the electrification agenda? I'm not sure they call it consulting. It's more I, I agitate. <laughs> I terrorise. Well, what I mean, I terrorise governments everywhere. Well, I suppose what I mean is that you you um you talk to them, they I talk do. to you, yes. they read your work. I'm I'm particularly interested in the private sector in Australia. Any thoughts? And I, you know, and it would it would vary sector I, to sector, obviously. My co-founder at Rewiring America is a guy called Alex Lassie, and he he said something extremely wise to me when we were starting our work. Um, he's like me and a, a startup nerd and an energy nerd, but he was always, I was more technology leaning in my career. He was more business model leaning. But the thing he said was lasting political change happens when you get a, when you have a coalition of the winners. And the idea there is like, there are going to be a huge number of winners economically, business sense in this unprecedented global energy transition. Schneider, the, our host today, is like a perfect example. They win hugely in an all-electric world. Mm -hmm. um, the solar companies do. The electric vehicle companies do. Like, there's a lot. There's a lot of winning to go around. And I think those companies need to work together to become this coalition of winners that can push heavily on the regulatory and policy environment to make it help them win even more. Because right now, you know, we've literally had a century where the, we, we wrote policies 
by and for fossil fuel companies. Mm. It, and I don't mean that wasn't any conspiratorial sense. It was a good idea at the time because we didn't have another option. Yeah. But now we've got a huge amount of regulatory crud, whether it's bad vehicle policy, bad yeah. transport policy, bad building codes, like all of those things need to be fixed, anticipating this very highly electrified world where um, every home needs to have vehicle charges, every roof needs to have solar, like we got to go back in and fix the all, all the regular things. So I think the task for business now is, you know, not only to look after their own interests and plan for this electrification future, but like work together to write the regulatory environment that we need. Because like the government doesn't have infinite wisdom. They actually need industry to come in and help them know what to do. Mm. And so I think we are lacking the coordination of all of the industries that are going to win to write the rules that help us win. Throughout your work, you're really great at articulating the community benefit, the complex and um, multifaceted community benefit of this. And that's critical because it's often very much presented as a kind of a, a technological solution, which ha isn't necessarily about people or a kind of a... Um, a solution for you know big corporations are at the head of the game on this. You've seen the community benefit in your own uh, your own area in um, the south coast of New South Wales. You write about it in your quarterly essay, Wires That Bind. What do you think are some of the um, you know surprising community benefits of electrification that you've seen both in Australia and around the world? Well, I think we're still trying to make it come true, <laughs> but. Yeah, I, in my community, we, I live in postcode 2515. There's a community group that's like agitating to electrify faster and mm -hmm. like be the world's first all electric community. And we're having victories and we've got the Wollongong City Council, who is our overlord. They are like all on board. They kind of, you know, our work planning and figuring out our community, they want to adopt in their climate strategy. So mm -hmm. we're seeing this like nice snowballing effect. But the the, the benefits were not quite happening yet, but we can see them coming. And I think, you know, here's the story. It's it's pretty extraordinary. Like the average household in my area, and it's actually true Australia-wide, spends about three grand a year on petrol and diesel. That makes no jobs in your community, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, that's money we send overseas on a one-way ticket to the tune of $30, $40 billion a year. Um, but we should and could be, you know, the solar on the, the roof of the school and on the roof of the church charging all of our cars, that'll be two cents a kilometer. And then that money, that $3,000 that left the community will stay in the community. Yep. Um, and that is an extraordinary um, opportunity. Like within our postcode 2515, we spend 14 odd million dollars a year on petrol and diesel. If we're not spending that and we're spending that in the community instead, mm -hmm. like that's amazing. amazing. Incredible what we could spend on new jobs or training or it creates jobs know, like you name it. It'll be it'll be high paying tradie jobs doing the all the electrical work, the more more solar, the HVAC work. But even better than that, it's actually the savings generating jobs for in the community at cafes for artists for all the other things because we'll be having more disposable income to spend on all the other things in life because we're spending less dun, 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 on oil and gas. Thank you so much, Saul Griffith.